hi. <laughs> Long time no see. Uh, you're probably wondering why I haven't made a video in a while if you're a subscriber, or maybe you're not, I don't know. <laughs> For those who are wondering, um, you know, I just have all of the regular excuses, all the same ones that we always hear from people on YouTube, which is, I'm busy, I have run out of time to do a lot of stuff on the side, outside of my normal life things, so that includes making content, uh, you know, yada yada yada, all that stuff, the holidays were busy. Um, I don't want to make excuses, but that's just kind of the facts, and I've kind of just been prioritizing resting and relaxing in my spare time, and that unfortunately means that creating videos has kind of fallen to the wayside. So I do apologize for that, but um, you know, I can only do as much as I'm able to and if I just don't feel called to make content or I just really need to prioritize relaxing if I've had a rough week or whatever, then I'm going to do that and I think I realized that I was stretching myself a little thin with making videos. So all that to say, I will try to keep creating content when I can. It's probably not going to be very consistent as far as I know. Uh, I don't really have a set schedule for making content, so that's just what's happening right now, and I just wanted to let you all know that. So, with that out of the way, we can go ahead and talk about today's subject for this video, which is horror films with my favorite aesthetic. And when I talk about aesthetic, I'm talking about the overall look of a film, but also the general feel of it, just the vibes. <laughs> and uh, for me, it's going to be a specific combination of some different elements that aren't necessarily a set genre or subgenre. It's just kind of this feeling that I get from a movie. <laughs> and how I define it is hazy, dreamlike, fairy tale horror. So when all of those things combine, it just makes something sort of magical for me. And I would call it my favorite movie aesthetic ever. So like I said, it's not really a real subgenre. And so to kind of go into a description of it a little bit more, uh, when all of these sort of elements are combined is when I get a feeling for this kind of a movie. So things like hazy visuals, that's going to be sort of gauzy looking film. Uh, if you are familiar with the way that a lot of 70s movies look, that's the kind of look I'm talking about, where everything is sort of hazy and there's like almost a painterly quality to it, if that makes sense. So movies with like a soft focus to them, as far as uh, the logic of the film goes, it can be kind of dreamlike or nightmare-like, depending on the tone of the scene or of the entire film. Um, but mostly a sort of dream logic is what I'm referring to. So when things just sort of happen, it feels like you're in a dream, the way that the story functions. In addition to that, uh, these movies have that underlying sinister feeling that kind of permeates the whole film. And this is what I would call uh, the element that makes it horror. There is also kind of an overarching feminine quality to all of the films on this particular list, and it's just something that I sort of noticed as I was compiling it, that most of the stories focus on women or girls, and in particular, a lot of them are coming-of-age films. So, like I said, that seems to be a common thread in these movies. It's not particularly, like, a requirement for the um, hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror movies overall, but it's just something that I happen to notice with these particular films. These films usually have a supernatural element to them as well. So having things like magic, witches, werewolves, vampires, uh, monsters of some kind are definitely a key element to these films. And it also has a either closeness to nature that happens within the film. So the setting is either in a natural place, like a forest or um, out in the country somewhere. Um, and it could also have an isolation from people or cities. Uh, so going to a remote location, either one or both of those things is a factor in these films. And I will go into specifics on that when I talk about each individual movie. Uh, so just for the overall vibes, kind of imagine something like 
beautiful women in flowing dresses traversing a cemetery or a witch cat with glowing green eyes in a secluded mansion in the country, girls climbing into wells and transforming into werewolves, stuff like that. <laughs> so like I said, it's not really a hard or fast rule for me what these films have to have. Those are just the kind of general things that I think about when I think about these kinds of movies. There's just something about combining dark subject matter with soft and beautiful imagery that I find weirdly satisfying. It just kind of scratches the right part of my brain. Uh, so I wanted to share these sorts of films with you if you also are into this sort of style of filmmaking and subject matter of film. So that is why I created this list. So we're gonna go in chronological order for this list and I'm just gonna start out by introducing the film with the spoiler-free description that is listed on Letterboxd. And after that, I will go into a little more detail about the film and end with the particular things that I like, uh, things that I think make it a hazy dream like fairy tale horror. And I will just preface that section with things I like. And I just wanted to give a reminder to check trigger warnings for these films. Some of them do deal with things like domestic abuse and SA, so if those are things that you're sensitive to, definitely please check trigger warnings before watching any of these. So there are eight films on this list, and I'm just gonna go ahead and dive right in. And so the first film on my hazy, dreamlike, fairy tale horror list is Valerie and Her Week of Wonders from 1970. Valerie, a teenager living with her grandmother, is blossoming into womanhood, but that transformation proves secondary to the effect she experiences when she puts on a pair of magic earrings. Now, seeing the world around her in a different light, Valerie must endure her sexual awakening while attempting to discern reality from fantasy as she encounters a lecherous priest, a vampire-like stranger, and other worldly carnival folk. So Valerie and Her Week of Wonders is kind of a vampire movie, kind of not. <laughs> it's a lot of things, but it is definitely a coming-of-age film. Like literally, at the beginning of the movie, the titular Valerie is seen having her first period. The image of her blood dripping down onto a bed of pure white flowers is a very obvious metaphor, but strangely beautiful nonetheless. And it has that combination of loveliness and darkness that I was talking about in the intro. This film is considered part of the Czech New Wave film movement, which is a super interesting style. Look into it if you haven't heard of it before. And it is heavy on the dream logic. You never quite know where it's gonna go. You just have to go along for the ride. It's incredibly whimsical, yet deals with very unnerving, serious topics like religious figures abusing their power and the sexualization of young girls. Speaking of that, I did wanna add a little caveat to this movie. And I just wanted to say that this film was made in the 70s. It was made in Europe. It was a different time, different place. Not excusing it, but uh, it does include nudity of a minor. It is brief, but it's in there. And this minor actress does kiss a couple of um, adult actors in the film. So I just wanted y'all to be on the lookout for that and just know I don't condone that, but it is in the film. Like I said, different time, different place. Still not great. If not for that, I would absolutely deem this as like the perfect hazy dream like fairy tale horror. But regarding the things that I do really like about this film and I think are done very well, uh, the creepy little masks that the villains wear, I think that those are really well done and it's really funny seeing them um, kind of hide their face, but kind of not. It's kind of like a parody of evil people trying to mask their intentions. I also really enjoy the Catholic imagery that's woven throughout the film. I've talked about this on my channel before, that as an ex-Catholic, that kind of stuff just really resonates with me. I also love the levity and playfulness that Valerie has, even when she is faced with terrifying things. Even though she has, quote unquote, and those are heavy air quotes, become a woman, she is still very much a child and retains her childlike ways. And this specific image really speaks to me for some reason, and it actually segues very nicely into the next film on this list, and that is Daughters of Darkness from 1971. A newlywed couple, Stefan and Valerie, are passing through a vacation resort. Their paths cross with a mysterious, strikingly beautiful countess and her aide. That description doesn't mention this, but this movie is a vampire movie, and a lesbian vampire movie at that. 
It is the first one on this list, but it will not be the last because for some reason a lot of lesbian vampire movies fall into this sort of aesthetic. And I think part of that is because there were a lot of those movies made in the 70s. And like I said, the 70s style of filmmaking is where it's at for this kind of aesthetic. So look forward to multiple lesbian vampire movies on this list. Because it's set in a posh Belgian hotel for the majority of the runtime, this film lacks the closeness to nature element I mentioned earlier, but it definitely has the isolation factor to it. The hotel is virtually uninhabited aside from the newlyweds, the Countess and her ward. I love that the Countess is literally supposed to be Elizabeth Bathory and how they take the whole mythos of her bathing in the blood of young women to remain youthful and turn it into a vampire story. That really works for me. I could see how some people might read the Countess as falling into the predatory lesbian trope, but I personally see her as liberating Valerie from an abusive relationship and empowering her. And the look of this film is simply stunning. At any point, you could pause it and frame the still as an individual work of art. Things I like about Daughters of Darkness, the Countess is serving every single look. She looks like a freaking movie star. It goes without saying, but Delphine Seerig is so gorgeous. I just love the glittery shimmeriness of it all. And anytime a shitty man gets his comeuppance, I have to cheer. <laughs> Next up, we're headed to Spain with La Novia Ensangrentada, aka The Blood Spattered Bride from 1972. A young newlywed woman begins to have disturbing nightmares just after settling into the old mansion that has belonged to her husband's family for centuries. When her sinister dreams come true, the innocent bride is caught in a maddening maze of unspeakable horrors. So this movie pretty much checks off all of the boxes of a hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror for me. First off, it's gorgeous to look at. The colors, the costumes, the setting are all fantastic. There are several moments where you're not sure if the main character is dreaming or imagining things, so it definitely has a dreamlike quality to it. And you know what else it has? Lesbian vampires, you guessed it. So Daughters of Darkness and The Blood Spattered Bride occupy the same space in my brain. I feel like they're very similar in many ways. The newlyweds, the scary abusive husband, the beautiful vampire that lures the young bride away. They have all of those things in common. And just as the Countess in Daughters of Darkness was based on Elizabeth Bathory, the vamp in The Blood Spattered Bride is based on the titular character from the 1872 vampire novella Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, which predates Bram Stoker's Dracula by 25 years and is credited with creating the archetype of the lesbian vampire. The more you know. In The Blood Spattered Bride, we get glimpses of a mysterious woman shrouded in a lavender veil. She is always seen in the woods around the mansion, which is where that closeness to nature element comes in. Things I like, we get mysterious paintings of long dead or so we think, ancestors, women brandishing ornate daggers and cuddling in coffins, love it. Plus the surrealness of a man just finding a woman buried in the sand on the beach, wearing nothing but goggles and a snorkel. I mean, who thinks of that? So yeah, all of these seemingly random elements make up a perfect example of the hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror aesthetic to me. Next, we're going from 1972 to 1973 with Lamora, A Child's Tale of the Supernatural. A notorious bank robber kills his wife and flees the police, only to be captured by a mysterious group of figures in an abandoned town. His beautiful daughter, Lila Lee, receives a letter stating that her father is near death and that he needs to see her. Sneaking away at night from her minister guardian, Lila embarks on a terrifying journey. So Lamora, I'm just gonna call it Lamora for short, is actually set in the 30s. So it is a low budget period piece gem from this era. And it's actually not that hidden because you can find it here on YouTube. I will go ahead and link it in the description. So if you wanna watch it after this, you can go ahead and do that. The mythical elements in Lamora are vampires, undead children, and ghouls. It's definitely the least polished of the films on this list. There are some slow parts and some of the acting is kind of stilted, but there is a certain charm to it that I really admire. It's a pretty straightforward coming of age story. Our protagonist Lila is exposed to the horrors of the real world, as well as the horrors of the mysterious town of Astaroth. And in traveling to Astaroth, she goes to, you probably guessed it because I'm sure you're catching on to these patterns by now, a secluded house in the middle of the woods. So check, 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 and check 
for coming of age, isolation, closest to nature, and mythical elements. Things I like. The title itself, I love a film title with a colon in it, and it just rolls off the tongue and really paints a picture in your mind of what the film is going to be like. I also enjoy the makeup effects for a low budget movie from this time. They're really good. Here's a neat little clip I found of the director Richard Blackburn talking about it. Shout out to the channel Nostalgia Kinky for having this clip. We make a low budget film, there's three things you're not supposed to do. One, you're not supposed to do period. Two, you're not supposed to have heavy makeup. And three, you're not supposed to have a lot of night shooting. We did all three, mm -hmm. right? We made more mistakes because we didn't know, you know, what, what was wrong or what you, you shouldn't do. So we made more mistakes um, and then probably invented some mistakes and made them too. <laughs> so if you thought we were leaving the 70s anytime soon, you thought wrong. <laughs> the next film is Picnic at Hanging Rock from 1975. In the early 1900s, Miranda attends a girls boarding school in Australia. One Valentine's Day, the school's typically strict headmistress treats the girls to a picnic field trip to an unusual but scenic volcanic formation called Hanging Rock. Despite rules against it, Miranda and several other girls venture off. It's not until the end of the day that the faculty realizes the girls and one of the teachers have disappeared mysteriously. If you're a cottage core girly, you will probably love this movie. This is another period piece and another coming of age story. It's set in 1900 and we get some incredible period costumes in it. Trusty old Wikipedia bills it as a mystery slash drama and no, you won't find any ghouls, goblins, or vampires in it. But though it's not overtly a horror movie, the horrific aspect is more in the mystery and the existential threat of it all. The fear of the unknown, of wondering what actually actually happened to these missing girls. We see the girls go off on their own and explore this beautiful but treacherous landscape, escaping into nature, and in doing so, they shed the societal expectations that are meant to keep them docile and subservient. It's very cathartic, but also eerie and haunting at the same time. And seeing how everyone else deals with the disappearance in different ways and the effect it has on those who are present at the picnic is super interesting. And it's all wrapped up in some of the most breathtaking cinematography I have ever seen. Things I like, the these very artsy, slow-mo, overlapping shots, they really give the film a sense of ephemerality. Also, all the food they eat looks absolutely delicious. I want to eat all of it. That is until ants start crawling all over it. <laughs> and the fact that it's set on Valentine's Day gives it an extra tinge of wistfulness. So now we're leaving Australia and heading to Japan for the next film, Haosu, aka House, from 1977. Hoping to find a sense of connection to her late mother, Gorgeous takes a trip to the country to visit her aunt at their ancestral house. She invites her six friends, Prof, Melody, Mac, Fantasy, Kung Fu, and Sweet to join her. The girls soon discover that there is more to the old house than meets the eye. This one is wild. <laughs> it definitely has a more psychedelic bent than other films on this list. And I found this out very recently, but the production company, and I've got to look at my notes to check the name of it, but uh, the Toho Studios production company um, approached the director and I hope I say his name right, Nobuhiko Obayashi, um, approached him to make a film like Jaws. And if you've seen this movie before, you're probably going, what the hell? This movie is nothing like Jaws at all. They wanted something that was kind of like a big blockbuster summer hit like Jaws, and this could not be further from that. But I'm so glad that it turned out the way it did because it's absolutely a cult classic, and I can say I have never and will never see a film like it ever again. It's entirely unique. The visuals of this movie will stick with you for the rest of your life after watching it. From men spontaneously turning into skeletons, to girls being eaten alive by furniture, to decapitated heads biting people's but it's pretty much a surrealist masterpiece. And it's got those hazy dreamlike fairy tale hallmarks of coming of age and traveling to a remote location where inexplicable things occur. Things I like, Blanche the witch cat. She is so fluffy and cute and those sparkling green eyes, come on. The piano scene also sticks out to me. I love the effects here. They are so wild and so cool. Like it's terrifying, but also really funny. And in general, the use of animation mixed with live action has a super interesting and unique effect on the film overall. Traveling now from Japan to France, next we have Fascination from 1979. A runaway criminal breaks into an eerie chateau, taking its two frightened chambermaids hostage. As night falls, a group of mysterious aristocratic women arrive and the criminal begins to realize the women are hiding a sinister secret. Oh, you thought we were done with lesbian vampire movies? 
wrong. Fascination is set in the early 1900s, another period piece, we love to see it, and in it we have characters that drink human blood in order to retain their health. I believe in the movie it's specifically stated that they drink blood as a cure for anemia, which sounds like it was probably an actual thing in the early 1900s, but I'm not exactly sure I didn't look into it. So ostensibly there is a lack of a mystical element in this movie, but I mean they are essentially vampires. It's what the director Jean Roland is known for, and I think almost all of his filmography, minus the straight up um, <clears throat> corn stuff obviously, uh, could be on this list. I will admit I haven't seen all of his films yet, so of the ones I have seen I decided to include Fascination for these reasons, which I will just go ahead and say are my things I like. First off, the first shot we see after the opening credits is Chef's Kiss Amazing. There are these two very refined looking women dressed in elegant early 1900s outfits just casually standing in a slaughterhouse with Ox's bodies hanging from the ceiling and blood covering the floor just casually sipping on little glasses filled with blood. That to me is the perfect combination of the feminine mixing with the morbid. It's got that je ne sais quoi that just screams hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror to me. And three words, that scythe scene. Oh my god, I can't show you a ton of it here because one, I don't want to spoil it all for you if you haven't seen it yet, and two, nudity. <laughs> so I'll just give you a little taste of it. Also, this movie is a lean 80 minutes, which is great, short, sweet, and to the point. I love it. I think we need more movies like that. And with Fascination, we are finally exiting the 70s and going into the 80s with this last film, which is The Company of Wolves from 1984, an adaptation of Angela Carter's fairy tales. Young Rosaline dreams of a village in the dark woods where Granny tells her cautionary tales in which innocent maidens are tempted by wolves who are hairy on the inside. As Rosaline grows into womanhood, will the wolves come for her too? The tagline for this movie is the desire, the fantasy, the nightmare, which I think perfectly sums up the whole feeling that the hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror aesthetic gives off. It is heavy on the fairy tale and dreamlike aspects because it is essentially an anthology film where the wraparound story is dreams. All the short stories within the movie are dreams that our protagonist Rosaline is having, and these dreams are all about werewolves, hence the title. And it feels like something straight from a fairy tale book because, well, it is. It's based on a short story by writer Angela Carter, who actually worked with director Neil Jordan on the script for the film. The setting varies slightly from story to story, but they are all basically located in these dark, misty woods, which for me sets the perfect tone for a good werewolf tale. Rosaline embodies all the innocence of of Little Red Riding Hood. And her grandmother, played by everyone's grandmother, Angela Lansbury, tells her the worst kinds of wolves are hairy on the inside. And when they bite you, they drag you with them to hell. That's some A plus advice, Angela. I'm telling you, when the innocent meets the sinister and you add a dash of mystical surrealism, you've got some prime hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror. Things I like, I particularly love the story with the haughty aristocrats that turn into wolves while still wearing their fancy Parisian garb. It's such a great metaphor and visual gag. And going off of that, all of the costumes are to die for, and most of the actual werewolf effects hold up really well. And that is it. That is my list of hazy dreamlike fairy tale horror. I know it's kind of a mouthful, but honestly, it really just encapsulates everything that I love about these movies. And I hope that maybe you have found some new films to watch from this list. Uh, I would love to know if you know of any ones that would fit into this list, this category that I didn't mention. I really want to find more that I can add to this sort of aesthetic, this subgenre. I don't know what even to call it, but um, yeah, it's just a kind of style that I really, really enjoy. So I really want to seek out more movies like this. I would especially love to find some that are newer because obviously everything on this list was from the 80s or earlier. So if you know of any that are more or modern that kind of fit into this aesthetic, I would really love to know. I do really like that it was a sort of international list. Uh, we went from, let's see if I can think of all of the places we went um, for these films. We started with Czechoslovakia, we went to Belgium, Spain, Japan, Australia, the UK, France, 
and America. So we went kind of all over the globe with this list, which I love. So like I said at the beginning, I'm not sure when my next video is going to be up. Uh, uploads are going to be kind of sporadic from here on out. I really hope you guys still stick with me and still check out my content despite that. Like I said, I'm just kind of trying to take care of myself as much as possible. And sometimes that just means resting and relaxing instead of frantically trying to put together videos. So um, this is one that I've been working on for a little bit and it's something that I just really wanted to um, make a good video of because it's something that I'm really passionate about, this kind of film. So I do really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please, please let me know in the comments. So that's gonna do it. That's it for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I so appreciate it. I hope you all have a fantastic day and we'll talk horror next time. Yeah.